Well, my birthday was about a week and a half ago on August the 20th. Any August birthdays here? Anybody? Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you for wishing me a happy birthday, too. I know you were doing it in your mind. But my wife um, knew it was my birthday, so she planned a little mini party. Only two of my boys were home, but she made me a cake, my favorite kind of cake, chocolate cake, put up some balloons, and we had a little party. And at one point uh, during that time together, she asked me, what do you remember about your birthday parties growing up? And it was kind of a surprising question. I hadn't thought about it. Of course, it's a, a while ago now. Uh, but the first birthday party I remember that came to mind was when I turned 12. Now, 12 for me was a good time of life. Um, 13 and 14, not so much. But 12 was a really good time of life. And what I remember was, um, at that time, I loved baseball. I still like baseball, but I really loved it when I was 12. And so we had a baseball theme party. My dad uh, loaded up nine or ten of my buddies in the neighborhood, we, and my brother Joe, who was only about nine at the time, and we went down to a local ball field where we played our Little League games, and we did a baseball party. We ran the bases for time, and we had a pitching contest, and then after we did all that stuff, we wanted to play a little real baseball, so we decided to play a little mini game. But we didn't have enough guys for two full teams, so my dad uh, said that he would be the all-time catcher for us, and then we could take turns pitching and hitting. So that's what we did. Uh, now, two things you need to know is that we were using a real baseball, not a soft one, but a real one, hardball, and baseballs are hard. And my dad, uh, at that time, wore glasses. And he was gonna catch, and we didn't have a catcher's mask, but that didn't matter to him. It was a party, so he wanted to be the catcher. So he's catching, uh, we're playing hardball. I mean, what could go wrong? So. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to pitch first since it was my birthday party and I love pitching and my brother was nine he wanted the bat first so I'm pitching my brother's batting my dad's catching with no mask and his glasses on and, about, and I was a pretty good pitcher at the time and I really wanted to strike my brother out so uh, I was throwing hard and about the third pitch I fired it in there right down the middle my brother swung but he didn't hit it square but he didn't miss either he just tipped it so it went over my dad's mitt and smashed right into his face smashing the glasses into his eye socket, and he collapsed to his knees. And I went running in, uh, because he was on, in the dirt, and by the time I got there, his hands were over his face like this, and blood was leaking out of his fingers, and I was terrified. And he just said to me, go call your mother. <laughs> now, we were at a baseball field. We had no cell phones. It was like 1969, and so I ran about a quarter mile into town, used a pay phone, called my mom. She drove like crazy to the field. When she got there, she ran up to my father, and I remember my mother saying out loud, she began to pray. So her, her, her response mode was always prayer. So she said, oh, Lord, have mercy. That was her go-to prayer in Christ. Oh, Lord, have mercy. She would pray that often when we were driving and she was in the car. Oh, Lord, have mercy. But she began to pray, and then she took my dad to the emergency room, and they fished all the glass pieces out of his eye socket. His eye was fine. He has a little scar to this day, but he could see and all that, so everything turned out fine. But I remember that party for obvious reasons, uh, but mainly because it started out as a baseball party and turned into a prayer meeting by the end. But we all celebrate. We celebrate all kinds of things in our lives. We celebrate birthdays and weddings and graduations and all kinds of stuff, but we don't necessarily think of celebrations as being a spiritual event, but they are. Uh, we're finishing today, as most of you know, a summer-long series um, on the disciplines of grace. And week by week, we've been talking about building into our lives these healthy spiritual habits that help us experience God his grace, his presence, uh, in a deeper and personal way. And the last one we're talking about is the discipline of, of celebration. That sounds a little bit funny. Like, why would you need to have discipline to celebrate? But celebration really is the whole point of spiritual life. Richard Foster, who some 30 years ago wrote a book called The Celebration of Discipline, writes, celebration is central to all the spiritual disciplines. Joy is the end of spiritual disciplines functioning in our lives. So the point is joy. What he means is, uh, like when we talked about remembering in one whole sermon earlier in the summer, then in another whole sermon we talked about gratitude. What he's saying is that when you can start to combine things like remembering and gratitude, what you get is celebration. In fact, I think we can turn it into a spiritual equation. I made this up. Remembering plus gratitude equals celebration. I think that's true. And then I started thinking about it. I could probably make a more complicated equation if I wanted to. Try this one. Gratitude plus noticing plus serving plus eating and gathering times generosity and seeking. That equals 
gratitude. Then I thought, I wonder if I could get them all, in all 12 of them in, and I, I got, it got too complicated for me, and I'm not good at math anyway. But the definition of celebration is that celebration invites us into God's joy by remembering his goodness. Celebration invites us into God's joy by remembering hidden goodness. And in fact, I think I could say that all celebration, all celebration draws us toward the joy of God himself, even when we don't realize that's what's happening. The Old Testament story of Nehemiah, uh, which I'm pretty sure most of you were not reading this week, it's a, it's a small story way back in the Old Testament, but it's all about the rebuilding of the ancient wall of Jerusalem. Uh, the return of the people of God to the law of God because they hadn't had the law for decades. And so the heart of this ancient story is celebration. Let me just read a few verses to you out of Nehemiah 8 as we begin to talk about celebration. Scripture says, Then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra the priest and teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law, because they hadn't had the law for like decades. Verse 10, Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink and send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. I'm going to talk about three things today. I'm going to talk about the power of celebration, then the command to celebrate, and then the reasons to celebrate. First, the power of celebration. Let me ask a question. How many of you can tell me exactly where you were at 11.47 p.m. Central Time on October the, uh, excuse me, on uh, November the 2nd, 2016. Some of you got it right away? Okay, where were you? Just hollered out. Cubs. Oh, watching the Cubs game, right? That's, that, that's the night it all happened. I was in our family room with my wife and one of our sons, Jesse, and as I recall, my wife was sitting on the couch. My son and I were standing up watching the TV, but we, we, we couldn't bear to sit down. We're watching the game, standing up, um, and the moment that the Cubs beat the Cleveland Indians, eight to seven in the 10th inning in the World Series was 11.47 p.m. Central Time, first World Series in 108 years. So now how many of you know where you were that night? Okay, most of you know, right? That was such a great time, look at that picture. I'm not so sure that's gonna happen again anytime else. So. Not saying, I don't want to be Debbie Diner, Downer, but I pay attention. Now, that sparked a celebration, we all remember. It began that night, extended to a parade, a great parade a few days later, and that celebration seemed to continue for weeks, if you remember. Now, three things about the power of celebration. First, celebration is the power to bring people together. In this great story of Nehemiah, if you read through it, you'll see how many times it refers to the people gathered together. And here it says that, that Ezra and Nehemiah called the people together to read the law to them, to remind them of what God was doing for them. Because that's what we do when things happen that we celebrate. We want to come together. On the night the Cubs won, thousands of people gathered around Wrigley Field to celebrate, but the game was in Cleveland, remember? People just wanted to be together. And over the next few months, I saw people in coffee shops still wearing their Cubs stuff. Like two months later, still talking and enjoying and being together to celebrate. In the same way, our spiritual celebrations are to bring us together. I'm going to talk more about that in just a moment. Secondly, celebration has the power to help us remember that which is most important. To remember that which is most important. Think about the things that we tend to celebrate, the personal passages. We celebrate birthdays and anniversaries because they're important to us. Think about the spiritual seasons that we celebrate, like Christmas or Easter. We celebrate that which is important to us. In the story of Nehemiah, the two things the people were celebrating were the rebuilding of the wall, I'll talk more about the wall in a little bit, and the reading of the law of God, the word of God. They had not had it for decades. Now the word is being read and they celebrate because that was what's most important to them. Thirdly, celebration is the power to bring rest. To bring rest. Years ago, um, in a staff meeting, one of my colleagues here at church at that time, um, 
I even forget what we were talking about, we, but we had had one big event, we're heading on to the next one, and he noticed my tendency to finish, to accomplish one thing and move straight to the next thing on my list. And what he said to me surprised me. He said, he said, Brian, do you ever take time to celebrate? I was like, what do you mean? He goes, do you ever take time to celebrate? And it surprised me a bit, but he, what he was pointing out is this tendency that I have uh, to be a little celebration challenged. Does anybody relate to that? Anybody, anybody feel celebration I mean, like, other people celebrate, woohoo, woohoo. My wife celebrates like that. I'm like, yay, you know. I, I just can't get it to come up and, and, and out. I'm a little celebration challenge. I don't think about celebrating. I move on to the next thing. But the fundamental reason that we need celebration, God says, is rest. That's the whole reason for his command to observe Sabbath. Sabbath, he said, was leaving all your work behind, leaving everything else behind, and spending time in the presence and grace of the God who wants to restore your soul. That's rest. And rest is connected to celebration and worship, which is why, over and over again, God in Scripture commands us to celebrate. That's the second point today, the command to celebrate. Now, some of you know that uh, back in July, I was able to take 17 days and travel uh, on behalf of Chapel Street to uh, Turkey and to East Africa, several countries there to visit some of our Serve the World partners in those parts of the world. Wonderful experience. Uh, and I, while in Africa, in Uganda, I met a man named Fred Wangwa. Fred is the uh, spiritual director of the Cure Hospital in Uganda, one of the major neurological uh, hospitals for children in that part of Africa. He's also pastor of a small church in a city called Mbale, Uganda, and he's planted over 10 churches in the mountains up uh, to the north of Mbale. Now, Fred, just right after I met him, invited me to preach at his church the next day, which I didn't know I was going to do. It was a great privilege. This is his church, a um, small church in a tiny little village. Uh, and so he came to pick me up on Sunday morning at about 8 a.m. in a van, we jumped in the, in the van, and drove about 30 minutes outside Mbale to a little tiny village where the church was. And as we got to the church, 8.30, 8.40, I could hear the people already singing inside because they use the sound, there's a sound system and they're, just, they're pounding away and they're singing loud. I could hear the singing. But right as I started to hear the singing, Pastor Fred asked me if I would participate in a baptism service he wanted to do that day. I said, sure, when is it? He goes, right after worship. I said, I don't have any clothes to change into because I didn't know it was right then. He said, it's okay, we can go back to the hotel and get your clothes. I'm like, but the people are already, he goes, the service is just starting, it's okay. So we got back in the van, went back to my hotel 30 minutes, got my clothes, back in the car 30 minutes more, so it's an hour later, we get back to the church. As we drive up, they're still singing. <laughs> they're still worshiping. We go inside, and there's another 30 minutes of worship before I preached. They're singing and dancing and singing and dancing. It was exhausting. <laughs> now, part of that is cultural. It just is. But part of it also is I mean, these are people who live in homes, houses, that are made of sticks and mud. This church didn't even have a bathroom inside. You had to go out to a, a, an outhouse and a hole in the ground. They celebrate like that because it's rest from the rest of their lives. It's just grinding poverty and suffering, and they celebrate. And that's why God commands us to celebrate in worship. The Psalms are full of this kind of thing, but in Nehemiah, we see it as well when we see that uh, Ezra, the teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, listen to what he says, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. Then Nehemiah says, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks. Send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Notice it says, this day is holy to the Lord your God. When I was studying that this week, I learned something that I really should have known by now. I don't know why I didn't know this. But the word holiday is actually the two words holy days stuck, stuck together in, in Old English. So really it's telling us that every holiday is a holy day created by God to enjoy his goodness. So in a sense, God created, invented holidays because he's holy and he's good and he wants us to know his joy. 
We, we see Psalms, I mentioned before, are full of this kind of thing, full of the command to worship. Psalm 150, for example. Let me read these words to you. Praise the Lord, is how it starts. That's a command. Praise the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His surpassing greatness. Praise Him with sounding of the trumpet. Praise Him with the harp and lyre. Praise Him with timbrel and dancing. I don't even know what a timbrel is. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with the clash of cymbals. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. It's a command. Worship, we often say, is offering extravagant devotion to someone or something. That's what worship is. So human beings are hardwired to worship. We all worship something. We all give extravagant devotion to something. But we are to celebrate and worship because we are extravagantly devoted to the God of all joy. If we jump to the New Testament, for example, we see that Jesus began his public ministry in the Gospel of John, chapter 2, by going to a wedding party and turning water into wine. You know the basic story. Let me read it for you and point out a couple of things. John says, on the third day, does that remind you of anything? It should. On the third day, a wedding took place in Canaan and Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Now, why would she say that? Why was that important? Well, in that day, wine was everything. It meant the party was over. When the wine ran out, the party was over. The joy was gone. And it was a source of great embarrassment and shame to the groom's family that was hosting the party. It meant they ran out. They couldn't support the whole party. Woman, why do you involve me, Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. I love that. It's such a mom thing to say. She doesn't pay any attention to what he says. Just do whatever he tells you. He'll know what to do. <laughs> Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Wait, wait, wait. How much? Six jars holding 20 to 30 gallons each. That's 120 to 180 gallons worth. Remember that. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. So something between verse 7 and 8 happened. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants that had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best until now. Okay, two things here. First, Jesus makes a crazy amount of wine. It's a crazy amount of wine. It's 120 to 180 gallons of wine. I, someone said that in today's world, that'd be between 900 and 1,000 bottles of wine. This is a small little community. Small, this, they could party for a year on that much wine, right? And he makes the best wine they've ever tasted. Here's the point. Jesus kept the party going. Jesus came to bring joy. In fact, Jesus himself is the party. Verse 11, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. 180 gallons of wine revealed his glory, and the disciples believed in him. By the way, this story is one of the reasons why Jesus was criticized by his enemies. They said, oh, look at him. He, he celebrates too much. The really religious folks, the Pharisees, accused Jesus of being a, a party goer, of being a glutton and a wine bibber. That's just a polite way of saying a drunkard. Jesus turned water into wine to demonstrate that the whole point is joy. In John chapter 15, he says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Paul, later in the New Testament, says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. The whole story of the Bible ends with a great celebration. John tells us in Revelation 19, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready. Who's the Lamb? That's Jesus. Who's the bride? We are. The church. So the whole story ends 
with a wedding celebration. And where did Jesus turn water into wine? At a wedding celebration. The whole point is joy. And that leads us to the third point today, and that is the reason to celebrate. The reason to celebrate. I said earlier that the story of Nehemiah, this ancient story, is about rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. Now, in the ancient world, ancient times, city walls were enormously important to the people who lived in those cities because uh, the walls meant security. It meant your enemies couldn't get to you. It meant strength. And for the Jewish people, it was their very identity as the people of God. It was the blessing of God. Their wall had been broken down and burned by fire decades before and had been in ruins. So through Nehemiah's leadership and what the story is about, that wall was rebuilt in 52 days. And when the project was complete, here's what we read, Nehemiah chapter 12. At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the Levites were sought out from where they lived, those are sort of the holy men, the priests, and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully the dedication with songs of thanksgiving and with the music of cymbals, harps, and lyres. I'm gonna summarize the next part. Then Nehemiah brings in a bunch of musicians, he brings in two great choirs. He sets them on the, on the top of the wall and, and sends the choirs marching in opposite directions while they're singing and playing music. So this is a great celebration. Imagine people walking around the top of a city wall and music's playing like crazy. And then we read this, verse, 20, uh, verse uh, 43 of chapter 12. And on that day, they offered great sacrifices, rejoicing because God had given them great joy. The women and children also rejoiced. And then this phrase, the sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away. The sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away. They celebrated because the wall was their security. The wall was their identity. The wall was their strength. The wall was the visible symbol of God's goodness and blessing. So they celebrated. So here's the question. Why do we celebrate? centuries later, as followers of Jesus. Why? What do we celebrate? First Peter tells us, Peter writes, notice the words I put in red. He says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Why praise? Why celebrate? In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There's reason number one. We've been given new birth into a living hope. That is, through faith in Christ, we receive a new heart through the forgiveness of sin and new identity by being adopted as his sons and daughters. And what happens when you are adopted into a new family? You receive a new inheritance. Notice verse 4. And into an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade, this inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are being shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Second reason, we have an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade, can never be taken away. We receive a new destiny. And by the way, this is why those believers in Africa and other parts of the world celebrate and worship for two hours, three hours at a time. Because they have a destiny that's so much better than, than what they can even imagine. And they long for it, and they talk about it all the time. We here in our culture we kind of like our lives the way they are, right? We don't think a lot about our eternal destiny because life is pretty good. In most of the world, life's not very good. And that destiny means something, and they celebrate it. Verse 6, in all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. This is the third thing. We have a hope. Notice, it's not a hope that spares us all suffering and pain. It's a hope that sustains us through suffering and pain. In verse 8, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So as followers of Jesus, that tells me we are to be the most joyful, celebratory people on the face of the planet. We are. Not the most somber, not the most serious, not the most righteous, 
not the frozen chosen like I used to hear, but the most joyful, the most celebratory. Why? Why? We celebrate because in Christ we have a living hope. In Christ we have an eternal destiny that never perishes, spoils, or fades. In Christ we have a hope that sustains us through suffering and pain. In Christ we have the promise of salvation that will be revealed but is present now through the Holy Spirit. We are filled, therefore, with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Years ago, I got to hear <coughs> um, a speaker named Tony Campolo. Some of you may know who he is. He's in his late 80s now, I think, written a lot of books. Uh, was a well-known speaker at that time, and I heard him speak several times. And I actually heard him tell this story live. He's also written it into a book that he's called The Kingdom of God is a Party. And I've actually used this story. You may have heard me tell it before. But it's a great story. It illustrates what we're talking about today. Years ago, he was invited to speak in Honolulu, Hawaii, made the trip from Philadelphia, was jet-lagged, woke up the first night at 3 in the morning, couldn't sleep. So he walked out of the hotel, found a greasy spoon diner just to get a cup of coffee and a donut. So he's having a cup of coffee and a donut in his diner, and a few minutes after he sits down, a whole group of women, eight or nine women, come walking in, provocatively dressed, uh, boisterous. They are uh, women who have been working the streets. Politely spoken, they were street walkers. And he, got, he was uncomfortable, so he decided he was going to leave right away. But before he could leave, he overheard one woman say to the group, Hey, tomorrow's my birthday. I'm turning 39. To which another woman sarcastically responded, What, do you want to throw us a party? You want us to throw you a party or something? Big deal. And this first woman was kind of hurt. She said, No, I didn't mean that. I haven't had a birthday party my whole life. Why would I want one now? And Cavolo heard that, overheard it, and he had an idea. He waited until the women left. Then he went up to the cook and said, hey, those women come in here every night? He goes, yep, every morning, 3 o'clock. He said, does that woman, the woman sitting next to me, does she come in too? He goes, yeah, that's Agnes. She comes in every morning, 3 o'clock. Why do you want to know? He said, well, I overheard. She said, tomorrow's her birthday. What do you say we throw her a party? He goes, what? He goes, yeah, let's throw her a party, 3 in the morning, tomorrow morning. Cook goes, that's a great idea. I'll make a cake. You bring the decoration. So the next morning, he gets there at 2.30 in the morning. They decorate the place. Big sign, happy birthday, Agnes. Uh, they have a cake made with candles on it, and they wait. Sure enough, 3 o'clock, the women come walking in, they yell, surprise, birthday party, and they start singing happy birthday to Agnes. And she starts to weep. And they finish singing, and she's just weeping, and nobody else knows what to do, so the cook goes, Agnes, uh, here, cut the cake, let's have some cake. And she looked at him, and she said, do you mind if we don't eat it now? i kind of like to keep it for a while. And she picked up the cake, and she left. And they're all in the diner, and the birthday girl has left, and they don't know what to do. And Campolo said, I don't know what to do. So I said, hey, let's pray. <laughs> he said, let's pray. And he prayed for Agnes. And he prayed for uh, her salvation. He prayed that God would be good to her, that her life would change. And when he got finished praying, he said, the cook looked at him and said, hey, you didn't tell me you were some sort of preacher. <laughs> what kind of church you go to? And Campolo says, the words just came to me. He said, I go to the kind of church that throws parties for prostitutes at 3 o'clock in the morning. The cook goes, nah, there's no church like that. Because if there was, I'd go to it, he said. Well, there are churches like that. We want this to be a church like that. A church that celebrates the God whose grace is great enough that he extends it even to broken people. We've been talking week by week about little, little habits we could build into our lives, things for you to try. And this week, I don't really have something else for you to do. We've talked about a lot of stuff, remembering, seeking, eating and gathering. So today, we're going to celebrate by giving you something. So as you leave today, we're going to sing a song in a minute. As you leave, the usher's going to be out there in the lobby, and they're going to give you each, if you want one, a balloon. Just a balloon like this. And what I want you to do is take the balloon home, and blow it up. And put it wherever you have your devotions. Just tie it up and put it wherever you have your devotional time. It might be in your car, leave it in your car, visit it at your desk, put it on your desk. In your library, put it in your library, wherever. Kitchen table. And, if you, and then just remind yourself of all you have to celebrate. And maybe as a family, all take your balloons at some din dinner time and blow them up all together. And then each take turns. Talk about something you celebrate. It's of God's goodness in your life. We celebrate because God is good.
and he's given us so much. And may the sound of our rejoicing be heard far away. Will you bow with me as I close? Lord Jesus, we thank you for the journey we've been on this summer. <clears throat> From gratitude to generosity, to remembering, to serving, to listening to all the other things we've talked about. We've been learning how to experience your grace. So today you're reminding us, actually commanding us, to celebrate. Because you came, you loved us, you gave yourself, that we might know your joy. So make us people known for our joy. And may the sound of our rejoicing be heard far away. It's in your name that we pray.